Even though all the pencils break and all the typewriters hang in the pawn shop window, words go on and their instruments with them. Today, I am one of them, writes John Wieners, a man whose being here was an instrument, as was his capacity to be out there, as the lingo has it, far out, uninsulated and among, protected, as he writes, only by the roof of his mouth. The other day, a curator offered to help me better exhibit John's work by creating a cradle that would necessitate the tucking in of his stuffed and wadded ephemera. A mash of birth certificates, takeout food flyers, coffee stains photos of Marlena Dietrich and Marion Moore, medical bills unpaid. But this ajarness was him and this inclusion, and to preserve anything else would be incongruous to his totality. I am one of them, Wieners repeats in a poem. I am witness not to wit men's vision, but instead the poor houses, the mad city asylums and real life work lines. His poems, as Robert Creeley once observed, never seem someplace else or divorced from their agency. They're here as we are, he says, a hopeful convention. Tonight's hopeful convening of friends of John Wieners doesn't seek to revive him or his work. He needs no resuscitation in these parts. He has always been a beloved member of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a part of our common wealth. We are one of him, we say tonight. And here to get us going, please welcome this evening's introducer and one of the great galvanizers of Wiener's material, Robert Dewhurst. Hi, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to MC the oral history of Wieners. Um, first, I'm just gonna say a few brief words about John sort of as an introduction. Um, but I wanted to first thank the Woodbury Poetry Room, especially Christina Davis and Mary Graham for conceiving and organizing this event and putting together such an illustrious panel of people to talk about Wieners. Um, although Wieners may have been surprised, I think, to find himself being honored by Harvard University, um, our setting is somewhat apt. <laughs> uh, Wieners worked at Lamont Library, which like, is across the street. Um, yeah. <laughs> he worked at Lamont for about eight months in 1957, and we might even say that the world owes some of John Wiener's greatest poetry indirectly to Lamont. It was partially his being fired from Lamont in August of 57 that spurred Wieners to move to San Francisco a month later, where he would of course immerse himself in the Bay Area underworld and write his indelible debut, the Hotel Wentley Poems. While employed by Lamont, Wieners also fastidiously studied Woodbury's little magazine collection in the course of editing the first issue of his own prescient little magazine, Measure. During this period, he once wrote to Larry Eigner, quote, here in Lamont, they have the Woodbury Poetry Room, and all magazines that are anywhere, they keep, and the locos like us read them. <laughs> At Woodbury, Wieners discovered small press precedents like Charles Henry Ford's Blues and Raymond Souster's Contact that were important to forming his understanding of what a little magazine could be. This, several years ahead of the heralded mimeograph revolution that wasn't to commence until after the publication of Donald Allen's New American Poetry Anthology in 1960. So I'm not only grateful to be in conversation with tonight's conversants about John Wieners, who's my favorite topic of conversation, um, but I'm also grateful to be having this conversation under the aegis of the Woodbury Poetry Room, which is a place that Wieners liked and learned from. An oral history is a well-fitting format with which to celebrate the poetry and life of John Wieners, two things which, in their Catholic capaciousness, have seemed to divide, defy conventional forms of literary history. When Wieners left Boston for the West Coast that September of 57, driving across the country on Route 66 in a cherry red DeSoto convertible, coincidentally the same month that Jack Kerouac's On the Road was published, he embarked on a decade and a half long poetic peregrination that would take him beyond the Bay Area to the fertile art scenes of New York City's Lower East Side 
and SUNY Buffalo's English department in the mid-1960s, as well as two eventful flashpoints of the mid-century literary avant-garde, such as the Berkeley Poetry Conference and the famed Festival of Two Worlds in Spoleto, Italy in 1965, before returning him to Boston's Beacon Hill in 1972, where for the rest of his life he would make his home in a small walk-up apartment at 44 Joy Street, overlooking the stately backside of the Massachusetts Capitol building. That last long sentence I spoke had several sets of M dashes, a definite style manual no-no, but it is difficult to find a grammar to contain John Wieners, who led a life defined, above all, by a resolute devotion to poetry as a way of life, to poetry as an ethic of contingency, community, chance, and circumstance, to poetry as posture, provocation, and precarity, as much as pattern, prosody, and pastiche. Wieners believed in poetry, that is, as not only the content of his life, but possibly its very form. Passages from Wieners' earliest extant journal, edited recently by Michael Seth Stewart for Star Scene in Person, published this fall by City Lights, reveal Wieners' deep sense of poetic vocation from a young age. A February 1955 journal entry, written just after Wieners' 21st birthday, testifies, quote, I once thought I could have embraced the wrong art, but it is not so. There has never been a doubt, no matter how dark the night becomes, or poems few, this is my road, and it shall make all the difference. There is nothing else for me to do true, but that is because I have made everything else in the world not worth doing. I have chosen this as the best, and I shall never forsake it, no matter if it leaves me or not. Poetry certainly never left John Wieners, and all his life he wrote remarkable poetry, stunning for its sting of emotional concision, sent in sonorous soft syllables, for its panoramic perceptions, for its radical commitments to flaunting, stifling, sexual, poetic, and even psychic norms. All his life also, John Wieners attracted anecdotes for his singular and inimitably poetic way of being in the world. For Wieners, poetry and life were inseparably intertwined, the one always a prism onto the other, and vice versa. Later in life, Wieners once reasserted his youthful oath to poetry in a reverse formulation from the one in the journal, telling Raymond Foy in a 1984 interview, quote, I am living out the logical conclusion of my books. While written literary history tends to stick to the plot of objective retrospection and tidy definitions after the fact, to the exclusion of personal anecdote, gossip, and memory seal tableau, everyone I have spoken to about Wieners has insisted on sharing stories, parables, incidents in the life by way of enunciating his poetics. Wieners' vocational sense of the art partakes in Baudelaire's vision of poetry as an elevated and ancient calling akin to a priesthood. But recollected stories from his life also vividly affirm Stephen Greenblatt's more recent precept that, quote, literature is not a self-enclosed system of signs, but rather a way of being in the world, a form of agency, a human act. In sum, his oral history can tell us almost as much about John Wieners' poet as the record of his poetry itself not to mention more staid forms of literary history and remembrance, and often somehow more. We could not be in the presence tonight of a better group to tell us stories about John Wieners. Emile Ackele met Wieners as a youth via the Charles Olson Circle in Greater Boston. Emile has written an excellent preface to the new collection of journals from which I quoted a moment ago, Star Scene in Person, and I believe also took the photograph of Wieners that graces the book's cover. And that's the photograph. Emile is a poet, professor, editor, and impresario of the celebrated Lost and Found Cooney Poetics Document Initiative. Jim Dunn sought out Wieners in the early 1990s as an aspiring poet and became John's closest friend and probably favorite mentee in his late years. In 2002, Jim edited Kidnap Notes Next, a posthumous pamphlet of Wieners', ev Wieners evocative notes and stray lines published by Pressed Wafer Press. And more recently, he edited A New Book from Rome, a journal of Wieners' from 1969, published by Bootstrap Press in 2010. Jim also penned a memorable introduction to Wieners' A Book of Prophecies journal, published by Bootstrap in 2007. Jim was at John's bedside in Mass General when he passed away in 2002. Raymond Foy has been a wellspring of Wieners' material for three decades now. 
1986 and 1988, Raymond edited the pair of volumes, Selected Poems, 1958 to 1954, and Cultural Affairs in Boston, Poetry and Prose, 1956 to 1985, for Black Sparrow Press, the sole books that kept Wieners' poems in print for a whole generation of readers in the 1990s and 2000s. As publisher of the boutique mini-book imprint Hanuman, Raymond also published two scarce volumes of Wieners' wild prose in the late 80s, A Superficial Estimation and Conjugal Contraries in Court. Wieners' most trusted editor, Raymond is the executor of his literary estate. Janet Malcolm has called Raymond, quote, a master of the intimate, a master of the art of intimate, complicit table talk. And to this I can attest, he has told me some of the best John Wiener stories I've heard. Finally, Fanny Howe and Garrett Lansing are each luminary Boston poets in their own right, and I'm sure need little introduction in this room. Fanny Howe was the author of over 40 collections of poetry, fiction, and essays, and was recently a finalist for the National Book Award, among many other honors she's received. Howe wrote an introduction to Wieners' 707 Scott Street Journal, published by Sun and Moon Press in 1996, where she writes of his writing as occupying an estate of being. Whenever I myself write about Wieners, I am inevitably drawn to quoting Fanny's lucid essays for such poignant axioms and insights as that one, available nowhere else in prose about poetry. Since the 1960s, Garrett Lansing has been something of the sorcerer of Gloucester poetry and letters, the erudite maven of all things not only literary, but also occult, esoteric, arcane, unseen of those secret areas of human knowledge and experience that were also dear, dear to John Wieners. Lansing published Wieners in his historic little magazine set in the early 1960s and enjoyed a lifelong vital friendship with John. Lansing's own luminous collected poems, Heavenly Tree, Northern Earth, was published in 2009 by North Atlantic Books. In his 1966 preface to Stephen Jonas's collection, Exercises for Ear, it was Lansing who coined the memorable moniker for the poetry group he, Wieners, Jonas, Edward Marshall, and others belonged to. Quote, the school of Boston, an occult school, unknown. But I think that with events like today's, the school of Boston is becoming belatedly, but much deservedly, less occulted, more known, and this is a very great thing. Um, so I think to start the conversation, I just wanted to ask everyone maybe to describe their first impression or encounter with John. And then we'll just let it unfold from there. <laughs> well, um, the first uh, real encounter was at Boston College when he gave um, a reading there and was introduced by a respectful priest. And John Kate was wearing a gold lame bullfighters. <laughs> Cape, and um, it was like a, it was a, a moment for me that was life changing, actually, because I was under the terrible Harvard <laughs> influence of of the great pronouncers, the po the great male poets, and suddenly there was a woman, <laughs> and it was John Wieners. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he had good manners. He had such beautiful manners. And afterward, and that was true for the whole life, that I've never met a more cordial human being. His mother did a really good job. <laughs> and he was, um, and that, that stands out for me now. And, by chance, I was just um, listening to a reading of In the Light, To the Lighthouse, Virginia Woolf's book, and there was this quote from a very unknown poet that reminded me of that evening with John that says, come out and climb the garden path, Luriana Lurali. The china rose is all abloom and buzzing with the yellow bee. We'll swing you on the cedar bough, Luriana Laura Lee. And that's the gentleness in, of John for me. Well, I'm in accord completely with you, <laughs> Fanny, about the gentleness. And the, 
I met John first, it figures out, in 1956, just for an afternoon. I was living in New York City, and I was up here to see a play of John Ashbery's The Compromise, and Frank O'Hara was there, and uh, friends from New York, Kenward Elmsley, and we went to Cronin's, uh, Frank and I, and um, John, he introduced me to John, uh, and we drank slow gin fizz, I remember, <laughs> the Cronin's. Uh, but then, much later, in the 60s, when I moved in 1959, 60, basically from New York to Gloucester, and met Charles Olson, I met John again and really saw him for two years very regularly in Boston because he helped me with my magazine set a great deal, which I somewhat modeled on measure, which I had read first, the first number in New York and read Frank's Second Avenue part that was in that. Because, um, and John found the printer for me in Boston. Uh, because a printer in Gloucester had refused the magazine after keeping it for months because of obscenity. And um, so that was by, again, accident uh, that John and I were walking in Washington Street and he found, or, or Tremont, found this printer just by, he pointed up at this boy. There was no problem then. And I saw a great deal of John. I was seeing a lot of Steve Jonas. I met uh, Joe Dunn. Uh, who John thought could have been the printer for set, but couldn't have actually at that period of his life. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, later on, well, I can't go into this at great length, but uh, I was present a little bit later in the 60s at really a tragic period in John's life uh, because I was a friend of Panna Grady with whom he was in love, and I was present every man and every woman as a star but the collision of stars, different people with different ideas of what life would be. And then uh, John's idea, uh, which was archetypal for him and in his poetry, of being a father and the relation to father and mother and to the virgin, all of this crystallized in a terrible shock. And shortly after that, I moved away from Gloucester in the early 70s and therefore so I came back often into New York. I was in Maryland. Uh, I was no longer in touch with what was happening to John. So, thank you. Uh, it's, it's very overwhelming to be here and to hear these things. Um, my first encounter with John is maybe a little bit more unusual in that I was a kid, basically. I was 13 or four, 13, really, 1969. Starting high school, <clears throat> my high school years were 1969 to 1973, so I was much less interested in school than other things. And one of the things that I used to do besides like usual Boston kid things, which meant like playing hockey on Boston Commons or other things, was I would go to bookstores and I started going to the Grolier and to the Temple Bar. Um, and at the Grolier, Gordon took a real liking to me and actually encouraged me to come there and cut school <laughs> and spend time on the sofa hanging about. And that's where I started meeting everybody who was around. And I met Garrett and I met John. And as Fanny said, he was, because there was a family connection to uh, Gloucester and to Charles Olson, Whenever I met any of these people, it was like an immediate, fa you know, I was family. So, so uh, John was just exquisite in that sense. And we used to just hang out. And it never seemed odd to me as a 14-year-old to go sit and have a coffee with John or walk from the Temple Bar to Harvard Square or go to the Cambridge Commons and sit around or just, uh, you know, spend time. and. It was quite extraordinary. And this picture I took in 1970, um, and you know, he this is a he gave me this copy of Amiel's journal uh, to Amiel from John with thanks for one photo, March 1970. Um, so you know, it was it was a very extraordinary connection. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, that's the beginning, there's more. Well, I, I heard about John 
from other poets. He really was a poet's poet. The, the um, respect that the poet, every poet had for him was extraordinary. But John was not in circulation. You just didn't see him. Uh, uh, I'm talking now early 80s. Uh, he was not around. And um, so he was, he was a rumor. He was a myth. And, and one day I thought, I, I grew up in Lowell, Massachusetts, and I, I'd moved around a lot, was living in San Francisco and New York, but I would come back to see my parents at Thanksgiving and Christmas. And one Christmas uh, uh, holiday around 1981, I just went and knocked on his door because he published his address in uh, behind the state capitol. He said 44 Joy Street, apartment 10. <coughs> so I got off the B&M train and walked up the hill rang his bell. I didn't realize he lived on the top floor and he had to walk all the way down. So he gets down to the bottom of the stairs and he's huffing and puffing and he looks at me and I'm thinking, well, what now? <laughs> but I've always believed in that sort of biblical adage of knock and the door shall open. You know, that's life. You just, you know, you just go for it. And I said, uh, Mr. Wieners, um, I I'm a great admirer of your poetry and I've been reading your poetry for many years. And I, I just wanted to meet you. I was wondering if we could go for a coffee or if, or if I could come in and, and talk to you. <laughs> and he looked at me, and it was a long pause, and he said, you're here to repair the toaster. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, I'm yeah, not. Yeah. And he looked absolutely crestfallen. <laughs> and, and he said, you're not here to repair the toaster. <laughs> and I said, no. I'm not. I admire your poetry. I'm a publisher, and I was hoping I could meet you. He said, you're not here to repair the toaster. I said, no. He said, can you come back tomorrow? I said, yes. What time? He said, same time. I said, OK, thank you very much. And, I, and as I walked down Joy Street, I, I remember thinking to myself, who's ever heard of a toaster repairman? <laughs> Little did I know it would be only one of a great many non sequiturs I was to hear over the next 25 years. So that was my first encounter with John. Mm. Oh, my God. Go back the next day? Yes. Oh, absolutely. And that's <laughs> when we, we hung out, you know, we just became fast friends from then on, yeah. My first encounter with John was in the early 90s. Uh, he was involved with Stone Soup, and Jack Powers was a person that lived right down the street from him, and uh, John relied upon him. And uh, he would read uh, some Saturdays and some uh, regular readings at uh, Stone Soup. But this was an off, uh, an off schedule reading. And I remember he had glasses with, one, with only one ear dongle on it. And the other one had, was just covered in, in tape. In fact, uh, I know that Raymond, every time he came up, brought, a, uh, brought glasses. And John really appreciated that. That was the best gift that he could get was glasses. So he read, and he, he mentioned in his introduction, uh, the Library of Congress, cleanliness is next to godliness, and, uh, and the Buffalo Bills. And uh, so he, didn't, he would not read any of his poems. He read nothing but uh, Wallace Stevens. And uh, everyone's like, oh, dear John, poor you know, John. You know, and I'm, I was fascinated. So I, I did the same thing. I walked up and said, that was fascinating. I go, uh, can I get a copy of your book? And he goes, oh, well, this is my copy, but you, you, know, you can have this, young man. And I said, all right. So he opened it up, and I'm Catholic, and he's very, he was very Catholic. And the first thing they teach you in Catholic school is to put your, your, your name in your, in your textbooks in the right-hand corner. And John had put his name in there. He didn't sign the book. It was like, this, this book belongs to John Wiener. I thought that was such a <laughs> touching thing. And I'm like, oh, that's so cute. So uh, I'm like, look. Uh, so I called him. I'm like, look, I work on 100 Summer Street. And he wrote a great poem about him and uh, Ginsburg walking down Summer Street with all the sailors when the sailors used to come in. And I said, I can meet you for lunch. And he said, oh, let's hold off on that for a while. Why don't we uh, wait till it gets a little warmer? <laughs> so, uh, so I call him again and I said, hey, do you want to uh, go uh, to lunch uh, now? He's like, oh, I don't, uh, okay. So uh, I walk over the hill. He, he wouldn't come over that side of the hill. So I walked over the hill and he would usually, well, later on when we met, we met regularly, he'd be standing in the middle of, the, uh, of Joy Street and he'd give me a big wave. We came down. So I said, oh, where would you like to go to lunch? He said, let's just walk down the street here. It's all right. We cross over, and I go, where, we'll go anywhere. And he said, all right, let's go to Burger King. So it became a ritual of ours. We went to Burger King, and we went to Burger King two or three times a week. And uh, it was funny, because John would always refer to us as we. So after a while, I put on a little weight. He was putting on a little weight. He's like, oh, we don't want to go to Burger King today. We're, we're gaining too much weight. I'm like, yes, we are. <laughs> too many Whopper Juniors. 
<laughs> so, uh, but he would go there, and I'd go with him, and it became a, a ritual of sorts. Then we would go to, uh, uh, to the CVS, and the two things he had to get at the CVS were perfect Jesus pills, the Perkajesic. Now, they, I, they're Perkajesics, they're just uh, regular painkillers. We call them perfect Jesus pills. But uh, that was my name for per Perkajesic, it's the brand. And uh, he, of all the painkillers, uh, for some reason, that one was always out, maybe because it had the perk name in it, and people thought he'd get a little kick out of it. So <laughs> if, if, it was, if it was not there, we'd have to go to the Phillips, which was down in the circle. And one time, we actually went over to uh, Cambridge, because we had to have them. And uh, we ran into uh, uh, to Elsa Dorfman in line. I said, oh, John, what are you doing? He's like, I'm buying my perk Jesus pills. <laughs> and then we stood outside. And then what he would do, he, he would also get primatine mist. And he would uh, stand outside and he'd have a you know, rubber band around his arm. And he'd be standing there. And he would take one hit of his, of his cool cigarette. And then he would take the primatine mist and go, oh. <laughs> and smoke. Now he would do that and, and, and enjoy it. Then we'd go to the uh, stop and shop and get a couple of things and walk it back up. And, and that became our regular, regular ritual. We, we, we really, went, Burger King was our, our place. So that was my... My first encounter was, was in the early 90s at TT's, and it developed into regular lunch meetings, and then we became good friends. <laughs> Can anyone speak to um, what features or personality traits or characteristics John had that you just haven't been repeated in another friend in your life? You want to just keep going? Yeah, let's around? just keep okay. going down right, the line. Yeah, right. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, you could start, Raymond. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I um, guess the fear of um, madness was in my generation and his, and then, and then people who did go mad was always hovering there as a sort of the word glass ceiling now applies to success. The glass ceiling then applied to failure, that a horrible thing had happened. And um, I had friends who had, in the 50s, late 50s in California, who had uh, gone over and never came back. And I did feel that John was um, and it's also a, a kind of religious state. It's where there are, everything is porous, so it's attractive too. It's not the the hard hard world anymore. Um, and so I had not actually face to face for many years um, since I was in California in the late fifties. Um, met someone who had done that, who had gone over the line. And so I felt very um, worried about him, and that was my main feeling when I encountered him, was that he was going to swing over and, I, and be lost. So it wasn't funny to me. It was, I had a wonderful couple of conversations with him when he swung out, but I still wished he hadn't, so that would be mine. <laughs> Well, in the 60s, when I knew him best, I would call it like a capering time. We capered. Uh, and I had no such fear about John at all. He was, like his own poetry at the time, uh, a great, of great lucidity mm. and great, uh, um, great ear for, his, for poetry. And we talked about that. We also talked uh, about all kinds of light things, sailors, movies, sex, various places and people in Boston, uh, some of whom were in a lot of trouble. A great friend of his early was Billy Donahue, who was later murdered by a trick, uh, much later. And uh, bars, which I was very involved with in Boston at the time, and actually through um, Steve, who had uh, legally various uh, medicines, uh, I, uh, there was always uh, various Benzedrine and other pills. So uh, it was a time of, of, of joy. And uh, uh, I had no, because of my own state at the time, certainly no fear of abysses. Uh, that might happen later, and certainly not with John, whose lucidity was exemplary. 
And uh, he came out to Gloucester a great deal. We saw a lot of Olson. And then later on, various things happened. But at the beginning, and this was when he was helping me with Set Magazine, um, there was no feeling of darkness. It wasn't fun. Mm. Yeah. You know? Um, trying to, as I was listening to Garrett and Fanny, I'm trying to think myself back, you know, and not see if I can, you know, not think about what I subsequent, subsequently came to know. But I guess I always felt, I, I was reading his poetry. I mean, I was reading his poetry and I remember Asylum Poems, and I don't know if anybody here knows who was involved in the press of the Black Flag Raised, which was uh, published the asylum poems in a, in a manila envelope on different colored paper. And I remember just being taken by that. So, and I, you know, just absolutely taken by it. So, I, I, and I think I felt when I was with John a certain, I felt in him a certain reserve, you know, of someone who, had suffered um, and who, you know, I would, you would occasionally see that gleam, you know, in him, uh, but certainly somebody who, who was observing everything, very, very uh, taking things in, very, uh, not passively at all, but but you know, there there was there was a suffering there that I felt, you know, even at that time. And this is around 1970. I'm thinking. Yeah, that's later. Than yeah, that yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking of one particular occasion, uh, which was uh, a, re a reading actually that I went to with my mother, who's here, at the Charles Street Meeting House, and uh, and I had photographs of all the people who read there. And I could never figure out what the reading was about. I thought it was something political, because there was Anne Sexton and Denise Levertov and John and Jim Tate, I think, and Ron Lowenson, and maybe a few other people. And um, I only found out in working on a Lost and Found project with Joanne Kiger in a letter that she had written to John saying it was a reading for the, for the Chicago 7. Mm -hmm. And it was just a few weeks before Steve Jonas died. Um, so I was, it, it was, you know, I, I felt, you know, I, I, there was a feeling that things were, I, I don't know, that, you know, I, I, uh, not, I don't want to say ominous, but a sense of, of momentousness of some kind that I felt, but I didn't quite know what it was about. Um, that's, I guess, what I could express, you know. Well, qualities that John embodied that were unique for me kind of everything you know the whole package was just so utterly unique but it was also very familiar um, because I was I grew up in Lowell Massachusetts Irish Roman Catholic working class um, he reminded me of my aunts and and so I got along with them very well because it, it was very easy but he was just an extraordinary combination of uh, he was incredibly intelligent. The, the, the intelligence was just dazzling. And he was really witty. And he was extremely funny. And that's something you don't so much get from his work because the work is so tragic. John was not a downer to hang around with at all. He was just an enormous you know, amount of fun. Uh, he was campy. He was outré. Um, I mean, I always say about him, it's kind of a mixed, me it is, it's a horrible mixed metaphor. but. He came as far out of left field as possible and hit the nail on the head, like every time. And just getting off the subway here in Harvard Square today, I walked down Church Street toward Brattle to find this old Chinese restaurant that we used to go to, because John always had these famous haunts that he would take me to in Boston. We'd go to Bailey's for ice cream sundae. Um, and, and there was a very, very old-fashioned Chinese restaurant from like the 20s or 30s, just to, pure chinoiserie, uh, heavily decorated. It's gone now. It's a Starbucks, of course. <laughs> and, I, and I was just thinking how we'd go in there in the afternoon for lunch, and John would sit there. And it, just to be in his presence was, in a way, it was so much more poetical. 
than even his poems. You just got this contact high of sheer inspiration and you saw things the way he saw them. And he'd sit there and he'd order a Brandy Alexander. And you know, I'm thinking that, you know, who orders a Brandy Alexander in a Chinese restaurant? It's like, you're never gonna meet that ever again, forget it. It's like gone, that was just a certain, when Frank O'Hara died, John wrote something where he said, a certain tone of town is gone. And that's how I felt about John when he died. There was a whole part of Boston Absolutely. that he kept alive Absolutely. with him. And then that was gone. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, to e echo what uh, Raymond said, uh, the, the, the most unique thing to me was his voice. And, that's what, and I immediately identified it because my grandmother's from Fall River. And I loved when he would say, oh, Jimmy, get that over there. Oh, shut the door. That's what, you know, shut the door. And so um, <laughs> I came to him you know, late in his life, and I, and I have a lot of uh, uh, challenges in my family with mental illness, and I, I met him with no history, I met him on an even keel, and it was just like, let's go to Burger King, let's do this. And I uh, totally agree with Raymond that his sense of humor and his intelligence and his sense of timing, <laughs> uh, you know, if, uh, he would play with the expectations. Uh, if people would come to him, so expecting the mythic John Wieners, he would throw out these non sequiturs that would that would really put them off. People that were behind the wall of noise knew, you know, and he's trusted, you know, very few people that, from my own experience was Raymond, uh, Charlie, myself, and Jack, and so those people, you know, they were they were behind it. But when people came to him, he 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 would put this out there, and he said some some great things, even to me sometimes. Like after we went down to Philly. I said, hey, uh, you know, what'd you think of my driving? He said, oh, the popcorn was tour de force. Do we stop for the dogs in the outskirts of town? I'm like, uh, no, but I'll, uh, uh, But you know, and then he would sit on the end of the bed and he would, he'd conduct, I think he, the, the other thing about John being totally poetical, he, uh, he would go places and there was no separation between um, his emotion uh, wherever he went and I would see him, you know, and it would pass, but he, he would be conducting these secret symphonies and then, and sometimes you'd see the clouds come and you know that he was having a difficult time, but, but they would pass and, it, and, and, and if you just let him, you know, follow through. I never had uh, the history, so I was just like, all right, let's go to Burger King now or let's go do this. And, and, it, and it turned out to be a, a relationship that was, was built on, on, on that level. And, but uh, I never met anyone, uh, the intelligence, the sense of humor. And, and he would be regal and he'd be offended uh, in the same breath he'd be, Totally uh, joking, like he, he could be very, very, you know, like uh, old school boss, and like, oh, how dare you, you know? And uh, in the same breath, you know, smoking his butt and, and taking his prime team miss. It was really an amazing <laughs> combination. And then going into the, you know, pickle loaf and peach, peach pies, he would get buy the same stuff every week, and, and you know, taking his, uh, his rubber band out of his hair and putting it around his arm, and, and every week it was just a, a total experience. And I agree with Raymond, I spent a lot of time with John just sitting in his apartment, and we wouldn't say a word. And then I, we we changed configurations, and I'd be going through his stuff, and I'd be like, and he would say something, and he'd be smoking in the back room, and and uh, we would go like hours without talking. I would sit there, and you you go into that room, you're so excited to, to, to get that contact high, but it's another world. It's like going into a museum, and he he would like take butter out and put it back in, or he'd plug, he unplug the the radio and, and and plug it back in. One time he had the radio unplugged, and he was singing, "It had to be you." Uh, and he plugs in the radio, and oh my God, there's Frank Sinatra singing, it had to be you. I go, holy shit. And he goes, that's, that was good. He goes, he's going to look like, you know, what? it happens all the time in here, you know? Yeah. Welcome to my world. He's like, waiting oh, for yeah. the radio yeah. repairman. So, yeah. That was amazing. He did that all the time. You see it in his work, too. He has a line, and he predicts something that, you, never, you know, it, it, it's, it, it, he was unbelievably uh, magical to me, and, and, and I, mm. I, I hopefully carry that with me. What was the inside of his apartment like at 44 Joy Street? Yeah, uh, well, Raymond could talk about it too, but I, so he, I think he had collages up that, that had been up for, for years. He had these naked angels. Uh, it was three rooms, and you walked in. It, it, it was a thin uh, walkway, and it, it led the, the kitchen to the right, and then it had an old-style bathroom that had the step going up, and he was on the fifth floor, so the, uh, he had the, uh, the, uh, the uh, fire escape that went right by his room. So there, there was a main room and there was two bedrooms. The left bedroom was his bedroom and the right one was where he sat and smoked and it overlooked the African meeting house. And uh, he had uh, this bamboo furniture I think he had for years there. Uh, it, was, it was a kind of patio furniture. And he had all sorts of accordions, uh, like uh, files and stuff. And he had all, it wasn't a swirl or tornado of, uh, of, 
of uh, of paper. Yeah, but but he had his own uh, system, and uh, I don't know what it was, but it, it was really you know really uh, it, it baffling at times, mystical, and, he, and it, his place was kept in his own way. Like, he's, oh, Jimmy, would you like a cup of tea? And he'd give me a cup, and it would look like someone hadn't washed it in six months. I'm like, oh, yeah, can I have another cup? <laughs> you know, so, you know, he had his own. And you know what? Uh, one time, Jim Burley called him and, and, and said, oh, hey, uh, John, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I was just cooking on the stove. I have something on the stove. He's like, oh, I want to talk to you about the new book. He said, oh, no, it's burning. I got to go. I never saw John cooking the stove ever. So he had this whole idea of it, and the place itself was a trinity of rooms. And uh, like he had a suitcase in the back with like a, a Coltrane album in it. And, you know, the thing about John, too, like every clipping that he ever had, he put it in his books. You know, anything about him, everything, and even his non sequiturs, I think, like uh, had had meaning. And everything in that in that apartment had had a meaning to him. And, and it, I mean, a personal meaning, more than just a collection of stuff, you know, from jury duty that he didn't respond to or, you know, or all the stuff that was amazing. And a lot of it he put in the books and it's in the. The collection that he just would stuff st stuff in there or, and and uh, ads and stuff, but it, but the, the apartment itself was was like going into another parallel universe to me. It was a it was a projection of his mind, and he spent a lot of time making collages. He spent a lot of time recreating his environment every single day, moving things around, pasting things up. You know, the spatial relations were very important to him. Um, and uh, he never cooked, he never used the stove, he never used the refrigerator, the door was open, it was unplugged. And he had these three rooms. They, yeah, they were fairly spare. They, they were a little bit messy. They were, you know, movie, movie magazines. And um, it's whatever he encountered. He was really into <coughs> tourist brochures. You know, if you ever, like we're at a hotel and you passed one of those racks of tourist brochures would be like, oh my God, you know, we're gonna be here for the next two hours. <laughs> he loved those and he collaged them. So he changed his environment and I thought it was part of his, kind of his meditation or some, some aspect of. And one day I went to see him and all around every room were two, were um, supermarket shopping bags one on the bottom and one on the top, making these nice, neat packages that I could not see in. And they were all around the perimeter of every room. And John had just gotten an NEA grant. And I said to him, John, what's in those bags? And he said, champagne bottles. <laughs> and I opened one, and there were six champagne bottles pointing up and six champagne bottles pointing down, empty. He'd switched from Carling Black Label to champagne yeah. when he got this and that was <laughs> that was another uh, you know, uh, I, home decorating tip I was going through some of my uh, journal jottings and I, I did notice that a lot of those bottles were still there they're dusty and he, and he kept a lot of those bottles so we kept them for whatever reason and when Corbett did that thing for me, gave him a bottle of champagne, I'm like, oh cool John let's go drink it and he went back and he called me for three or four days and sat in his apartment and drank it himself and uh, but he had all those bottles around the room still well, when I knew John best, it was before 44 Joy Street, and he was extremely nomadic. I was at his parents' house. Uh, actually, um, our friend David Rattray and his wife were married out there and spent time there. I spent time in New York City when John was in a very temporary apartment that I'm not sure it belonged to him. Uh, he had been, I believe, fired from the 8th Street bookshop, and this was on 1st Avenue. And he was kind of living by, um, uh, we living with a woman who was a hooker. And this was very, very brief time. I was visiting in New York. This would have been in the maybe 70s. I'm not sure at the time. Uh, because, as I said, I had moved away from Gloucester for a long time, so I didn't know. But I came back to New York, and my friend Steve Jonas was also in New York a number of times, I said, which was also um, uh, somewhat uh, um, dangerous time, in a way. Uh, Steve almost got killed by somebody he was insulting, uh, where he was staying with Russ Fitzgerald or somebody. Uh, anyway, uh, so... Uh, I thought of John at that time. He loved to travel, and uh, because he had been back and forth in California, and uh, it was his after his really his first hospitalization, I guess, which you know, after which he was still extremely clear, 
uh, in the early 60s that I saw a lot of him. And then uh, somehow, well, he moved back and forth to New York. He, uh, measure three, I think he was in New York trying to sell it there at the 8th Street Bookshop and other places. And that's presumably um, when he met Panna. I met Panna in New York also, but later. Uh, and then she rented the house uh, that he calls in a letter to, um, in a letter to um, Charlie Shiver, a chaumier, uh, in Gloucester. And uh, he lived in that. And that was a very strange uh, feeling indeed, because uh, this is a bad dream. going around out there. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, I have a, a, a letter uh, from uh, somewhere in here. Uh, yeah, a letter that he, uh, Charlie Shively, who should be here really, who was most helpful to John in his last years, um, they met through letters before they ever met in person because uh, Charlie loved uh, Wiener's poetry and wrote to him in Long Island in the hospital there. And uh, in a letter back, John uh, says something. Uh, well, he talked about poverty, because uh, Charlie Shiver grew up in Ohio in great poverty. And uh, I t wrote John about that and asked what John looked like and everything. And he said, uh, uh, yeah, here. Uh, he thanked him for his care for poverty. I am five foot nine and some blue eyes, brown, thinning hair on top, 145 pounds, 12 teeth left, bad eyesight, etc. Your uh, And then so he thanks for revealing his birthplace. This was before they met. And, uh, and of course, John was older. I was born in Boston and raised in Milton until this past year when my parents moved to Hanover. I haven't seen the new house yet, because this is still in. And then uh, he writes again uh, before they had met uh, about poverty. Uh, and uh, he, then he writes uh, from 1969, uh, even though I distrust, as you do, possibly, poverty as a means. It's interesting to see what two poor boys have to say. And then he says he read half of Malcolm L., Malcolm Little, he calls uh, autobiography, if not all. But it was three summers ago, and I have not forgotten it, when I was in love with an heiress. And we lived, honeymooned, lived together for a summer in a Norman chaumière outside of Gloucester by the stars without clock, telephone, or automobile, only a radio and a phonograph for communication. <laughs> and then finally, after these letters, they met together. And uh, Charlie was instrumental in helping John with a lot of things, as you know. But by that time, I had already moved. And then I moved back to Gloucester in the 80s and saw John in a different way. He had changed a lot from the second uh, hospitalization. Fanny, what did Wieners contribute to your understanding of what it meant to be a Boston poet? Oh, uh, well, I have to say that New York City was like a monster hanging over Boston in those days. And then everybody who was, well, no, I shouldn't make these sweeping statements, but a lot of poets and artists felt totally um, third rate by living in Boston. It was under, un, always under the shadow of, of New York. And in the 60s, a, a whole sort of a troop of, of visual artists who had been at the museum school and poets and black intellectuals left um, Boston and moved to New York. So it was, <laughs> it was a shadowy city. It was in a shadow. And this, I think this still is in some sense true. But um, John sort of drew the shadows onto his shoulders and made them into this cloak that um, had great 
power for people who felt what it what this Boston underworldness um, or of being in the underclass here. And I think he still is the essence of the Boston poet. He is its spirit. It's um, it's um, a quiet, a subversive spirit. It's so not New York here, and it, mm -hmm. and even more so than it was always the shadow and not the light. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. so that that's where he stands for me as the uh, great Orpheus. <laughs> that. Well, talking with, for me, talking with Charles Olson about John in the 60s, uh, he said exactly what you did. This is the Boston poet. And at that time, all the publicity was on Robert Lowell as the great Boston poet, the poet of Boston. And uh, Charles said, simply untrue. John Wieners is the great Boston poet. And that was, you said later, yeah. John, John said about Olson, why is it a major poet seems impossible to write about while the ingratiating success yields odes of dazzling elegy and national award? And, you know, in some sense, I think John, perhaps more than anybody of his generation, very succinctly and without much fanfare defined the impossibility of this country. And the impossibility of any actual recognition and just lived that way with the understanding that poetry actually had changed everything but it was invisible you know in some way and I think he really um, there's some way in which his occulted status made that possible to, to, to be that and to say that and to write that and I think it's just now going to start being discovered, you know, in some or way. not, or but not, I mean, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean discovered. Least, I mean, in the sense of you know, like at least he's a great poet. Well, obviously, that's yeah. what it all comes yeah. down to. Yeah, there's a book about Boston that I find very um, <clears throat> uh, enlightening about John. It's called Improper Bostonians, and it's a history mm. yeah. of uh, yeah. gays in Boston from. Puritan times to almost the present. And you see all the social forces that are at play in society, and it's a very proper place, and religion is very important. But there's a deep underworld. There's a real serious undercurrent that's very wild and seedy. And uh, there are these figures all throughout who are handing the torch down from one to the next. And John, it, you've just, you know, if you don't know the book, you've got to get it because John is part of that uh, tradition. And so I, I think that's always been a book that's um, been really uh, shed some light on John and his place in Boston. He just kept Boston alive in, in his head. He took me on a tour of gay bars in Boston once, and he did it so fast. We went in the back door of this bar over near uh, where the old uh, bus station used to be near Park Square, and we went in the back door and out the front door. And as we're going through, he's saying, this was Sportus. I came here with Jack Spicer in 1944. And then we went to the next one. And he said, and this was Playland, and, the, and this happened there. And he showed me like five gay bars in something like five minutes. <laughs> uh, and then and it was so out of character for him. But yeah, he kept, he kept just as he kept everything in its place in his mind. You know, it's kind of a Jesuitical thing. James mm -hmm. Joyce's father once said, you could drop the boy in the middle of the <laughs> desert and come back in three hours and he'd have it mapped. You know, he <laughs> just had this sense of where everything was, when it happened, what it was, who it was, and he kept it mm -hmm. all alive, and that was his source material. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I learned a lot of information, personal history. He had a psychic, he had a psychic geography, to, to Raymond's point, that. Uh, 
I like the, the preface transmutations that you see him going through the, the neighborhoods yeah. of Boston in his head and, and that mm -hmm. side of Beacon Hill was very important to him. And I wrote a lot about it after he, after he died. It, it actually physically changed to me because you could walk past a, a playground and he'd be sitting there, drive past the BPL, he'd get a check cash at the Glad Day and mm -hmm. he'd go see him, you know. But beyond that, the poems where he actually physically, you know, I mean, you, you physically travel with him across the country back to Boston, you know, the old mm -hmm. brick city by the Atlantic. And uh, I've, I've written more about Boston, I'm not even from here, but that, that, that geography and that, that side of uh, spending so much time there, learned really how to try to encapsulate that and Scully Square and, 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 and Milton and the Ponset River and you know, uh, all these things that, that, were, that were inside him. The personal history became like the history of Boston. He was very proud to be Boston and, 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 and it, was, it was definitely in his work. What was John like as a mentor? Uh, yeah, as a mentor, I, I think, you know, I, so he was really not, he, 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 he would have probably sh shivered at, at, at that. He, he would not, not want to be a mentor at all. One time, uh, we went to Maine, right? So we're going to Maine, and uh, we're driving up, and I have this, uh, this new SUV, and I have a little baby at home, and, and uh, we're listening to Ween, Ween and Wieners for some reason, listening to live <laughs> Ween, and he's smoking a cigarette, and I'm like, John, you can't smoke in the car. And, uh, and so he's like, okay, Jimmy, and he smokes the car, and he can't smoke in the car. He's like, go ahead, smoke it out the window, it's the whole ride up, he's smoking in the car. And I'm like, don't use the ashtray then, and he's using the ashtray. I'm like, so we get up there, and we get there, and we, uh, Steve Evans gave us this, uh, uh, like a whole floor, the two of us. And uh, the first night, no one else was there. So I gave John a bunch of, uh, I gave him uh, this, this book. And it has a lot of poems in it. And it has this really great thing. So the, one, the first thing John did was he hated that picture of himself. And he put this picture of Lana Turner above it. And then right when he died, I took, I took his, uh, his address off, off, his, off his mailbox and put it there. And then he went through the whole thing. I go, did you read the poems? He's like, oh, yeah, I did. And I'm like, here, I'm like, what'd you think? He goes, oh, I, I really like them a lot. I'm like, well, anything to say. So I noticed that uh, through this whole book, he just, uh, there's one place, where is it, that he just crossed out the word summer's death and, and changed it to breath. And that was the all he did in the whole book. And that was, uh, that was, that was definitely needed. I mean, <laughs> it, it was the right thing. So, uh, uh, like, we weren't, I think John, anytime, you know, like, mentor, it, it was just, as Raymond said earlier, it, it just rubbed off. It was a contact thing. And I think uh, it, it, was, it was something that I, I learned uh, just from, from being around him and, and, and taking him to readings. And, and, but one thing I learned from, too, that uh, the, everyone's expectation of, of what a reading was changed with John because he was very uh, intrinsic and, and introspective and, he, and he, it, it whispered to himself and you had to really you know, put yourself forward to listen to him sometimes and other times he was as heroic as, as could be it really, but when he was like that mm. it's like you have to come to me and I learned that and, 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 and if you did come to him the, 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 uh, the rewards were, were abundant but, uh, but it baffled people and it pissed him off sometimes too because some of the oh. readings were, were really you're kind of, oh, what's going to happen? It really was a feeling of like anything happened, you know, so. I want, at that, the, the last time I saw John Reed was at the Boston, which I asked you about what yeah. date it was, at Boston Poetry Festival. And I was with my brother, and I, I think you, you came yeah. with John and Charlie and Raphael de Grutola, and John read, and my brother, like a bunch of people like started getting very agitated and like started, you know, shuffling and didn't know what to do. My brother and I were like electrified, just nailed. I felt like it was like Rumi had walked down from, you know, Anatolia or something. I mean, it was just like unbelievable. And, you know, it just, you had to, you had to be prepared to receive that, you know, in some way. Well, Fanny read with John at the Waterstones. Do you remember that? Oh, how could I forget? <laughs> Oh, so there was so much expectation, and Bill's like, Jim, get, uh, you know, you're going to get him here. I'm like, sure I will. So we hung out. We partook a little too much for the first time that I partook together. And we're walking down Newbury Street, and he becomes fixated on an optometrist uh, display. I'm like, John, we're running a little late. Let's go. Let's get there. So we, we get there, and then he meets a woman who knew him a long time ago, and they're going through, like, postcards. And, and Bill's like, it's got to start. So then he gets up there, and, then, and it was a poetry audience that was expecting something from John. And he talks about living under uh, a, a, the rooming house porch with you in, in Buffalo. Yeah, living together, right? Together and in uh, Milton. In Milton, yeah, Milton, right? Milton yes. Millhouse, right? And and I literally thought it was the greatest thing ever. And I could just see people like going, ah, oh, ah, oh, <laughs> what? And then uh, then he read it, and I thought it was beautiful and brilliant. And the two you're reading together was was so great. But I think some of that audience was expecting 
something else, you know. And <laughs> well, let's say. Yeah, oh yeah, that's right, the railroad detective. Was that it? Milton Millhouse, that's what it was, yeah. You were, and I think people just didn't know what to, uh, to make of it, you know. Yeah, every reading was completely different. No yeah. two readings were the same. Simon saw so many, we saw so many great ones in New York. There was one at uh, St. Mark's Poetry Project, which always begins 45 minutes late. We call it poetry time. John insisted in getting there five minutes early. He started reading at eight. He read for five minutes. <laughs> Nobody was there. <laughs> Everybody showed up and he would not read again. That was it. He gave another reading there where by the end of the reading, people were shouting from the audience, we love you, we love you. Um, he would make it all up. One time he wrote a radio play uh, for a reading in San Francisco at the, um, uh, Roxy, at the Roxy Theater in the Mission. And there was a a, a, a literary critic and writer who was very into the trendy um, language of literary criticism and he was talking about deconstruction and Deleuze and skiz analysis and he was running through it was an on-stage interview with John and John's standing there with his arms folded looking down his nose at this poor fellow and he's going trying out asking all his questions trying out all his theories and John's not saying a word and after about 10 minutes this guy totally runs out of fuel and he just stops and John leans over to the microphone and he says, you are my prisoner. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> where do you get this stuff? <laughs> I, that's, yeah. Yeah. Oh, the Guggenheim. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, that story's too sad. Mm. No. I'll tell you a sweet, a sweet story with, with John was, was when he read at St. Mark's on occasion. And again, remind me of, of my memory here. But he, he got the NEA, and he came, you brought him down from, uh, from Boston. And uh, indeed, uh, nobody was, uh, was he, he gets up at one minute past eight and reads yeah. and finishes at three minutes past eight. And he reads this extraordinary work. I mean, always extraordinary work. But this was yeah. a, a stunning piece, which he'd written on the bus. Yeah. And I'm thinking, all right, because also you've got to listen real hard and the, and the tension. Of the, I think, all right, uh, John Fisk has the tapes. Mm. And, I, so I, and then St. Mark's would, would tape all the readings. And so I will hear this from John Fisk. No, it, the St. Mark's tape wasn't, wasn't working. Yeah. <laughs> Into the universe, gone forever. And he'd thrown it away, that's right. He'd thrown away the, the original... Uh, uh, Sometimes paper. he'd read things of other people, you know. He gave readings at St. Mark's where he would read Allen Ginsberg, he'd read Seymour Krim. Yeah. Um, uh, one time he was reading at St. Mark's and we were leaving, he was staying at my house, the apartment where I was living on 9th Street, and he walks out and he's wearing a uh, red Hawaiian shirt with birds of paradise on it with a pair of red Bermuda shorts. And it's the middle of the winter. And, you know, I, I probably shouldn't even tell this story about myself because, you know, it's like a really bourgeois kind of reaction. But I looked at him, I said, John, are you, are you going to go dressed like that? And he's like, you don't think I should, Ray? He's the only person that ever called me Ray except for my mother. And I said, well, I don't know, maybe... And, you know, if he didn't want to change, he wouldn't have changed. But I just thought it was a little lacking in self-respect. And so he went back and he really dressed up nicely. And he went and he gave this great reading. And I always thought, oh, you know, you're such a square. Why, why did you make him change? But he sometimes he just presented himself in a way that w I, I thought it was undignified. And I said that to him and he changed right away. But every reading was, every reading was an adventure. It really was. Yeah. Yeah, he'd do cut ups. He'd do live cut ups. Yes, I, I just wanted to say something about John's body <coughs> that um, uh, I'm reminded by watching you, uh, Jim, from the oh, yeah. <laughs> smoking and the yeah. inhaling. Um, I'm, I drove over uh, on, from Vermont with Amiel. Today and we were uh, reconstructing a uh, time when I was 21 in 1975, and it was winter, and we were on 53rd Street going to the Donnell Library to hear John speak uh, with John Ratty. 
Is John Ratty here? <laughs> um, and along of these many stories of his presentation of himself, um, I wrote, I kept a journal, and it's interesting in the five pages of this Donnell Library presentation, it was all about people's bodies. Um, Amiel and I were in the front or close to the front. John was right next to me, sorting through a lot of papers and wearing his winter coat and his um, scarf. And he gets up and he speaks. And next to me on the other side is a very ancient man who, in the process of John reading, the man is falling out of the chair on the, on the floor of the library. I mean, it was just nuts. <laughs> So then when John is done, he comes back and sits next to me with his overcoat. I mean, it's hot in the basement of the Donnell Library. And John Ratty gets up. Gerard Malango, Malango walks in and is taking photographs with his leather jacket. Everybody's bodies, you know. I just remember all these bodies. And what happens is John Ratty stands up and reads this terrible poetry. Sorry, John. And John Wieners can't stand it. And he gets up. First, he starts pulling on his, his, his scarf next to me. And then it, it, the, the tension of the scarf gets so much that he gets up and stands in front of the poet on the stage, near, right near the stage, and starts wrapping his head with the scarf. But he's not mad crazy. He is so insulted, <laughs> so bad, that he has to perform. He had to sort of insert himself. And, and it, was par it, it was sort of acceptable in a way. I don't know. Amiel, do you remember that? It I was remember like, it, yeah. I I'm remember. taking mad notes. I'm describing yeah. the, whole, the whole thing. We have it yeah. on paper. Yeah. So. Yeah. One thing I'm wondering, maybe Garrett, you could speak to this, or anyone really. Um, toward the end of his life, I'm kind of thinking of something that you said too, Emil, earlier, about recognition for poetry in America. What was John's sense of his own achievement as a poet or of his legacy? Well, that's a, a good question, but I don't think it's one that John himself would have ever talked about mm -hmm. or. Uh, uh, John had a sense of sanctity that uh, was somewhat hidden now and then, but at other times it came out. And it had to do with the veneration of beauty uh, and Ernest Dowson and woman, particularly. And he wrote this little series of essays late in life uh, called Woman. Mm -hmm. thing, yeah. But uh, I, I don't uh, think he would have liked to talk about his own vacation in a certain way, yeah, at all. And my experience of reading with him very early at the Stone Soup, which must have been in the late 50s or very early 60s when Stone Soup was uh, in Boston on Cambridge Street, uh, it was an extremely wonderful and straightforward reading. Uh, so there were, at this period of his life, there weren't anecdotes about him as eccentric at all, uh, nor was he. And his critical sense and his ear was incredibly attuned, and his criticism of others' poetry and, and uh, of, of Steve's and mine and other people when we talked about it at that time. Uh, there was nothing eccentric or outre or funny Particularly, I had a great sense of humor. Fun was there. That's what I meant by caper at the yeah. first times in the 60s of wandering around and talking about everything in Boston. Um, that was different from my experience later. Yeah. Can you describe him as a reader of poetry, of his own poetry in the 60s in that time? It was simply clarity. Uh, very, very clear and never a hesitation. And there was at that point, no question of, say, reading a movie magazine or something else. Uh, it was reading his own work. Yeah. And this comes out his intensity in those letters, early letters to Olson. Yeah. And then the careful letters to, um, to Charlie Shively before he had met him 
about Charlie's work and about changes there. I, he remained that. And at that point, he was in the uh, hospital in Long Island that he was running to Charlie. And so it was uh, late 60s, I guess. Uh, I did meet him with my daughter. Um, and I don't remember. It was 92 because I wrote, I wrote it down because we stood there talking, having a kind of hallucinatory but loving conversation in the cold right by the salt and pepper bridge. I oh, remember yeah. all the entire scene. And he said these words and looking off, and I wrote it down afterwards. He said, I look around and there used to be a rostrum in Boston, poets in the limelight but I don't see them anymore. For you and me, it's better to be unknown to do our work. And um, somehow that even in itself is a poem. The sounds of the words Rostrum, Boston, yes. Limelight, all, it's a poem. And, uh, but at the same time, weird and beautiful. So that happen, was my only I have to be with uh, John, when he was being interviewed by Kathy Salmons, and, and she asked him, what separates you from the other beat writers? What, why is your work different? How do you see yourself? So they got famous, I did not. And we all <laughs> laughed, and then he didn't laugh. That was it, that was it. That was the end of the story right there. Wow. I, uh, I would just mention that in the, in the preparation of the journals, um, we thought it would be prudent and ethical to get in touch with Panna Grady and ask her how she felt about that journal. And uh, I did, and I, I uh, spoke to her, I wrote to her, and then I said, call me, and she called. And we spoke for about two and a half hours. Wow. The f and then at the end, she said, I'm, I'm getting a little tired. Can, can I call you back tomorrow? And she called me back, and we spoke another couple of hours. And she's in, in the south of France. And, um, <coughs> The one thing that she was very, very happy to hear that John's reputation as a poet, that his work was being published, was being made available, would be because she said he, he was a great poet. And, you know, it was, it, she was very happy to hear that this was, all this stuff was happening. So. I was out there the weekend that the, all this storm was going on between them all, Olson, and it was at the Creeleys, and John was distraught. And um, I was out there with Jim Tate, hmm. and we were such, um, so ch ch innocent. We didn't know what was going on. We had just come out for the weekend, and there was clearly this horrifying under uh, current of emotion. And it was the, uh, uh, you know, that Olsen had gone off with his girlfriend. And, um, and it was shattering, and it was all in the atmosphere. And so the, that whole memory is shrouded for me in that drama of that weekend. And um, I remember Jim saying to me, I said, maybe we should drive to New York or something. And he said, I'll never drive to New York. It scares the wits out of me. And so. Um, <laughs> There was again that Boston, mm -hmm. New York thing. That this was when the Creeleys were renting yes, Anna's that's house right. the next year. Exactly. That was a year after. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's that castle out in Denison, right? That's in Street. Yeah. That, yeah. Oh well, then one of you flesh out the story of Panna Grady. Uh, well, it's really too for me too painful. Uh, really to talk about the uh, conflict, because at some point I will talk to a biographer about what Panny, Panna, mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a complete, well I can say this, complete misunderstanding of roles at that time between Panna uh, and John, and uh, to another degree the needs of Charles, an older man, and, uh, uh, and between uh, there, <laughs> There was simply John's idea of um, fatherhood was totally alien to Panna, who had a daughter by that time, by her earlier husband, and uh, who was uh, for John and others, and uh, certainly an archetype of beauty. She was very beautiful, 
Uh, and she was, a, a, Allen Ginsberg wrote this uh, poem about Madame Grady's literary salon before, because uh, she was a very generous uh, person to uh, many people, including Harry Smith, I mean, incidentally, as you might know. And Ed uh, Sanders. And Ed Sanders, many people, and she gave me some money, too. Uh, and she was a hostess at uh, the Dakota, where she lived in New York, and had had a, uh, anyway, uh, there was a, a total misunderstanding of uh, John's background, and her background was so utterly different. Uh, and so when she went to uh, London with Charles, uh, it, it was, uh, 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 an amazing, amazing storm, I guess, between, yeah, and then, and at that point, I don't think Bob and, uh, and uh, his wife knew exactly what had happened because they weren't there that summer when this was going on. Um, John was staying in my friend Harry's apartment at one point rather than in Panna's house, uh, and, uh, and well, Panna's house was a, itself a kind of storm center. Uh, at that time, the fugs came up. Uh, Ed remembers this time, uh, too, earlier. Uh, because, and also, um, Alan was up with the, his group of people, the Orlovskys were, uh, and Peter had to uh, whip his brothers who were, uh, to get them to move for, for health reasons, if that makes sense, and you probably knew that. Yeah, uh, and so this created a, a great sort of strange scene in Gloucester at the time, uh, and, and there were many visits. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah, and uh, well, Ed has written about some of this in his, one of his books about uh, mm -hmm. losing his own uh, mind, and all he could remember, uh, he was wandering in the woods after some LSD, all he could remember was my apartment downtown at that point, at 92 Main Street. And so he got a police car, to, which was amazing. He called and said, I don't know, I have to get to 92 Main Street. And they very kindly drove him. This was like four yeah. in the morning. And woke up Derek and me and called his wife uh, and then settled down. And he talks about this very frankly. But this was the same uh, summer. <laughs> that uh, Panna rented that house or something, yeah. And I think you've told me this was the summer that Frank O'Hara died also. Yeah, Ted was, Berrigan came yeah. up to announce that too, announce that, Fred had, that Frank had been hit by a, a, an effect of dune buggy in his fire island. This is all the same summer? Yeah, all the same summer, yeah. Panna was only there this summer, that thing. And it was the next year, I guess, that the Creeleys rented the house because I saw Bob's mother there at that time. Yeah. Yeah. But Berrigan drove through the night to deliver the news or something like that? Uh, yes, so exactly. That story, right? Yeah, about Frank. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we were, Charles and I think John Penn and I were sitting around at the house at that time when he suddenly arrived. Did you have something else to say, Frank? No. no oh. Does, does anybody in the audience want to yeah. tell stories? A couple minutes maybe about you and Uh, well, uh, Steve and, and, and Steve John, of course, were, uh, I mean, Steve was a very important force behind the early uh, First Measure magazine, uh, which I, I was not living here at that, at that time, of course, I mean, in Gloucester. I was in New York in the, in the 50s. Uh, um, indeed, uh, Steve was an, uh, extremely important aesthetically uh, for John and for Jack Spicer at that time. Later on, there were some rifts uh, between John's later metamorphoses and Steve, uh, as there were between Joe Dunn and, and uh, John, too. Uh, uh, but John was capable of, of somewhat irrational things about people's backgrounds, sort of, and, uh, later, yeah. And the three of you, and special memories of being together? At Steve's apartment, yeah. Um, John had no fixed place in Boston, and he was staying around other places. And he was still with his parents, and, uh, you know, yeah. 
For a while, he was working at Jordan Marsh. Mm -hmm. That didn't last very long uh, in Boston, yeah. He was selling heroin under the counter. Rene Ricard used to score heroin at Jordan Marsh from John Wieners when he was supposed to be selling men's neckties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, the period with Rene and, and around Boston and uh, then Bacchus Wiley, okay. all that moved. Yes, exactly. I, I, but I these was people all worship John. I mean, it was Rene Ricard yeah. and Victor Bacchus and Andrew Wiley before Andrew was a successful literary agent. Um, he and Victor had a basically a poetry tag team comedy duo, yes. and, uh, and they worship John. So yeah, John yeah. had the support yeah. of these yeah. really uh, advanced uh, uh, poets all along. Um, yeah, Renee and John together, that was, a, that was quite a combo. <laughs> Another great Boston poet. I don't know where I found this, but this is the Electric Generation with Baracus and Wiley. John Wieners, I was a junkie poet, and it's got a handwritten poem on the back by John. Mm. And uh, it's really got some, some, uh, some crazy stuff in it, so you can take a look at it. <laughs> did you bring some other poems you wanted to read, Jen? Yeah, I, I, I thought, uh, so what I did today was, uh, John had read in uh, 2000, and a lot of people in the room were there. And uh, so what I did today, they were never collected, and he wrote, he wrote them specifically for the Woodbury. So maybe I'll read one, just one of those, because uh, they're really great. And uh, Raymond and I were talking about John's early poems uh, to Raymond were like the Beatles, but the later poems really have a lot going on. They fly different places, and they really, really have a, so much. Uh, so I transcribed everything he said. Thank you. I used to work in the library here in 1957 uh, before I was discharged for the Benzedrine, effects on Benzedrine. But that was so many years ago. It must have been 33, 57 to 43 years ago. So this is for the Widener Library. Welcome to the Farnsworth Room. Over the holidays on Beacon Hill, when the weather was cooler, reminiscing from its backside, to be off of it, it gives us great pleasure to introduce yourselves to some of the joys a library engagement represents. I have read here before upstairs in the Lamont Library and warming to the staff and faculty members within your vast archives. The advantages in terms of acknowledgement allows little in the way of a personal expression. Manners always show education. And to have the exhibition hall in mind on the main staircase, staircases, a former employer might say, make sure the windows are open and the cases are not tampered with. Brings back memories of great delight Business corporations let them go at once. Here are keys and follow instructions toward lunch and visitors. Some had cards. Some were merely children. Some were on tour when the stairs were carpeted differently. An extra booth provided the open doors to honor the members to this vast system. It was extra duty for a glass of milk. Many were not allowed to know. Some came from different causes because of our youth out of faraway countries in strange costume. And I'll read it. Hmm. one more of them. February 21st, the year 2000, this year is what he said. The effects of this are many, perhaps, taken too seriously without enrollment. It gives you the opportunity to see one of your former presidents, Nathan S.C. Pusey, a handsome man with Medicare attention. He's very good looking. Reflect with James Branch Conant on these past educators, to the undergraduates, Yale, Boston University, Scranton, UCLA, Berkeley, what do they have? It was 1952 that guard duty chores demanded a raise in or a rise in working conditions. A detective house barn in Provincetown is not a Buffalo NYU home. The poor Polly Adler girls in an all man school, no wonder the skills of the twins, Farnsworth and Woodbury, were needed mm. to lighten that oppression. Cambridge men, mean to child laboring, unschooled southern environs, Victorian. Oh, and this would be the last one, because it's about Milton. Milton Village, the cabs without passengers, snob townies, outwit country club gowns. Who that Caesar was a woman for Solomon in a private collection, kept sacred by uniformed German officers, baby Goering, tight lipped Goebbels, Joseph and Herman with families here. In, in precious blue room at the top, Mondays. That the French girl should do doubles <coughs> in tennis from Mrs. D.F. as himself in a model suit. Silent auction gallery means the Warren Commission. Wow. Right. Yeah. Those are unbelievable. Yeah, there's, there's like four or five more of them. Yeah. 
And he also did that when he went to Maine. Uh, if you go to the big bridge, uh, it's called uh, Lisbon Indian Summer. And uh, they're still online. You can check out those. It really lists of books he was reading. And then it goes into poems about chasing bears and hitting them with sticks. And it's really uh, great, it's great stuff. goes outside. I think you might have been telling me this story. Too. Yeah. And and there's only these are the only copies of the poems in existence and he puts one under each tire. That's you know Charlie told that story, right? Char okay. And, yeah, and and but, but so Charlie was there for that and supposedly they were lost for uh, for good and I, mm -hmm. I thought it, Anne's not here, but I thought he told a story also that happened he took a whole manuscript and put it under a tire in the Fenway and somehow later on somehow they ended up in and in Ann Waldman's hands. I don't know how, but, <laughs> <laughs> but the sad part, I think a lot of John's manuscripts, a lot of stuff, a, a lot of stuff has been found, but a ton of stuff has been lost to the... Yeah, I, I always said that editing, editing John Wieners was just a matter of getting to the wastebasket before he did. Yeah. I'd like to read a, a very early poem of, of John's, which you reprinted in Cultural Affairs, uh, which I used when he gave me a choice of a lot of poems to publish in set. And when I chose this poem, he said, well, that's one of the very first poems he wrote, and he was almost to put it down. But it shows that he, he was not afraid of sentiment the way a number of other poets were at the time. And the depth of his feeling uh, which comes out in his poetry so often, uh, is in this very early poem when it's called On the First Page, when he was still living, I guess, in Milton. I, I didn't know the background when I published it then. It starts, Out my window runs the Neponset, a river enough to be written, but bloody from my baby wounds. Phlox flowers, purple for any passage or page or poem, planted because Mrs. Reddington had yellow phlox. Green grow the oak trees, giant leaves for publication. Beatings from their branches is not in content or text. Christmas star, Christmas tree, mistletoe and holly, but mother under everything in festival paralysis. Old linoleum, she laid on that also, only it was daddy who kept her there those times. My sister, but she cries at night. My mates, play and otherwise. Yes, I can sing of tornado nights on fire with black passion and no dawn mouths that bleed from kissing. Oh, it was love, love, love on our bathroom, bedroom, living room walls, but that house fall and go boom in the 39 winds. It seems there's nothing to sing out this boyhood window except her across the street in the blue bushes, my lady of the gold cloak, stringing silver bow and arrows, wanting eyes, waiting for me as for no other. Mother, at your feet is kneeling, one who loves you is your child. Mother, your altar boy is singing in sob syllables of sugar breath. Mother, cross my hands and hope to death appropriate me from the living. That's a strong poem. Yeah. Is there any last question at the back of the room? Oh, I, I had a question to return to the Boston geography. I, just because where he lived on Joy Street, is at the edge of the West End, and he was so attuned to the past. Uh, I was just wondering if that ever came up, if he talked about what was missing there in Boston, the Scully Square was gone, and the West End was gone. Was that a part of his personal geography of the city at, still? Yeah, he writes about it. He writes about it. You know, I mean, uh, urban renewal in the 60s was a form of popular madness. It's just unbelievable what they tore down, what they destroyed. And um, yeah, so I think John, he does, he does write about that, yeah. And um, he wouldn't talk about it so much, but you know, he'd take you somewhere and you go down one street and another street and you'd end up in a back alley. 
and it'd just be like a brick wall and maybe a garbage can, but you could tell it would be a really special place for him. You know, it was like, kind of like a shrine. I mean, John lived in a state of grace yeah. and reality was yeah. sacred and he was a priest and he was keeping the mysteries for all of us. And he was doing magic, you know, that's really what he was doing all day long. He was, ma uh, there's this great um, Jonas Mikas uh, quote from the New York Sunday Times this past week and they ask him what he does, he's 92, he says, I get up, I don't have any thoughts, I don't have any work, I make the angels do the work. <laughs> <laughs> that's what John did and that's, that's magic, so. Yeah, I would agree. I, I, I think uh, I, in Beacon Hill, he had an unbelievable uh, knowledge of these, these alleyways and things that I never knew existed. In, uh, like behind the, uh, the African Meeting House, we used to cut through there and it, it was part of the original uh, Underground Railroad. If you go back there behind the Meeting House and it comes out onto Irving Street behind it and all the uh, playgrounds. But I was going to say see the same thing Raymond did. He never talked about it, but in his poem, Scully Square, and, and he definitely was aware of it. And, uh, you know, You'd see him uh, like around uh, the government center, just standing there with his glasses. You know, I'd drive by, I'd see him on the street all the time, just looking at statues or just, just, just. Remember just, behind Brigham's yeah. down in the, uh, there was behind Brigham's, you could walk behind this um, uh, mall. Yeah. And there was like a little field that was left over and he liked to go back there and he'd just stand there and smoke a cigarette and look at this field. Well, it's funny because St. Joseph's is back there, and right behind there is where he, where he was at the party, and right, right behind there on Blossom Street is where he, he uh, was struck down when he had his, uh, mm. uh, the, uh, the stroke or whatever it was that, that, that felled him. That neighborhood, and that's all the, the old West End. So he died right in the heart of it. Mm. Um, I have a question. Uh, she turned on a dime. Was that ever published? And what? She turned on a dime? I know that uh, you... Uh, sections of it in yeah that uh, that came out in the first black sparrow book she'd turn on a dime was the name of the manuscript <laughs> he was working on late in life and i was uh telling john martin at black sparrow press that he had to publish a book and it had to be at least 400 pages because i thought there wasn't going to be anything else of john's to come out and i wanted as much to go in and i wanted the books to be printed as john edited them but then there was all this other stuff so i'm telling john martin at black sparrow press it has to be 400 or 500 pages. And John writes him a letter where he says, Dear Mr. Martin, I would like to inform you that the mistress of the Pope is a very wealthy woman. <laughs> My new book should be less than 100 pages, and it will be titled Night Nurse at Massachusetts General Hospital, a.k.a. She'd Turn on a Dime. And it went on like this. And John Martin, who actually was a bit of a kind of a conservative guy, even though he published, you know, Charles Bukowski, um, I mean, he made his living as a furniture dealer, and, and um, I think he was kind of like a, like a Christian scientist or more. He was, he, was, he was really weird, and he called me up all up saying, he's like, what, what, what is this? What's going on? And he's like, I got this letter from John Wieners. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> I'm like, okay, read it to me, you know. <laughs> and he did. So um, I had a lot of explaining to do, but I really wanted that late work to come out because... That was where John was at. And when Garrett was reading that poem, which is one of the first poems John ever wrote, actually, I saw all the late work in that poem, the way he moves from thought to thought. And it is pure projective verse. This is composition by field. Um, it's, it's, it's all there. And, and he takes Olson further than anybody does. But it was, so she turned on a dime, was the whole manuscript as I found it. And I got a lot of crap from it because there were a lot of people who said that this man is insane, he's mad, you're not doing him any favors by printing this, it doesn't make any sense. Um, it was a very controversial thing. It started out in 75 when Charlie Shively published um, Behind the State Capitol yeah. and Robert Duncan yeah. was furious and, and really thought that he was destroying John's reputation. Mm -hmm. So there was this tension throughout John's career uh, between, you know, the mad poems and madness and sanity, and I grappled with it quite a lot. Um, but I thought, well, he's still using words, so let him go. Yeah, Jim Lowell, who loved John, also felt the, the Asphodel Bookshop, and who uh, dealt with his 
papers for Buffalo, actually, yeah. and the letters and things, which were yeah. heartrending, he said. Uh, but he felt the same thing as Robert Duncan did, too, that this yeah. is terrible. For and I was saying John. tonight, walking over here, that, you know, it's the late poems that I read of John's all the time, maybe because the early poems, to me, are like, they're like Beatles records. You know, I don't have to listen to them. They're up here. But it's the late work that I keep going back to and finding so many, he's layered so many great mysteries there. And it is this picture of pure consciousness of one thought following another and the gaps in between them and circling back around again. So it's magnificent work. It's, abs it's, it's grandeur to it. I think you guys are saying, you guys at also, about hanging with John, mm. that if you took the time and sat there, everything started to come into place. It made a lot of sense. And that late work is so there. Mm -hmm. And what's amazing to me, um, anybody who's aware of people that have mental health problems, there are plenty of people in mental health institutions writing poetry. Mm. Not like John Wieners. That, there's a logic, <laughs> there's a form, there's meter, there's so much going on in those poems that infinitely almost more than Hotel Wentley in some ways. Mm. I agree with what you're saying. Not to take anything away from the Hotel Wentley. The late work's amazing, yeah. that he was able to write through everything and um, bring it over the way he did in the language. You guys are really great about it. Just, and, 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 but it's like that hanging. You gotta be willing to hang with it. Yeah, that it's last, easy the, to just say, well, this is crazy stuff. Yeah, the last, um, the last poem in um, 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 uh, Cultural Affairs in Boston, um, was a poem that I was sitting at my kitchen table one morning and John was staying over and I was preparing s some manuscript that I had to work on, I had deadlines and he was sitting there and he was talking to himself and I was getting really annoyed and I was about to say, John, shut up. And then I thought, wait a minute, why don't you just listen to what he's saying? <laughs> and so I didn't let him know that I was listening to what he was saying, I pretend to keep working. And I started listening, and then I started writing down what he was saying. And it was this extraordinary poem. And then when he saw that I was writing down what he was saying, he stopped. And later that day, I typed the poem up, and I gave it to him. And I said, what do you think? And he wrote the title at the top. He took out his pen, and he wrote Charity Balls. Mm -hmm. And it's a fantastic poem. So, you know, you could, he, he was always engaged in poetry. It's just, and, and that's where this thing about loving the early work, um, you know, the feeling was that he was betraying a belle latriste sensibility. And he just broke it open in such an amazing way. He's always the master, he, he always will be. Hmm. I think we'll end on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.